My story probably amounts to about the longest path one could possibly take to get licensed. Got into architecture uh, training through the technical route, you know, got a got an AAS degree way back in way back in 05. It was just a way to get into something that I knew I wanted to do, but I don't think I really knew what my actual goal was. So all right. I did that, started working at uh, started working at a nice design firm. And and quickly learned, wow, there's a whole lot more here that I want to do that I can't do with this. So after a few years working, uh, went back to school to the University of Minnesota to get my um, bachelor's degree, I think 2008 through 2011. And, and then shortly after that, around, let's see, yeah, in 2009, I got married. In 2012, we moved out of the Twin Cities area up to up to Brainerd, Minnesota, uh, with an undergrad degree from the University of Minnesota. That doesn't qualify, you know. It's it's not a professional program. The University of Minnesota, you need the master's degree, um, yeah, to be eligible for uh, for the ARES. After moving to Brainerd, I thought I thought my opportunity was gone. Yeah, I worked at I worked at a few different places, ranging from. Uh, um, kind of the high end lake cabin residential did that for a few years and then and then got back into the commercial world and that was all fine and great you know i was doing doing stuff that i loved when when you work in in kind of a smaller community like this you know you don't have you don't have a design firm that specializes in all these different markets i mean you're 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 a generalist firm so i was doing just a wide range of things. It was it was exciting. It was challenging. It was always new. But after about five years of doing that, I started seeing that ceiling closing in a lot sooner than I had hoped. And um, when you say when you say ceiling, uh, tell me more. Uh, what ceiling did you observe? Um, basically, not being licensed. Yeah, I just saw my opportunities closing in. You know, um, kind of those those opportunities to become partner in a firm or anything like that. Well, that's when I just started looking around. I'm like. I, I was curious if there were any opportunities for an accredited online program. And I think there's like four in the country. There's not very many. I, I chose the Boston Architectural College route. I started that in 2019, finished up here in, in well, about a year ago. The BAC path, it's brilliant because it has the IPAL component and um, and that's where that's where I became familiar with with your program. Got involved with with IPAL. Uh, that gave me access to the Black Spectacles, and and it was an interesting thing going back for a master's degree. Uh, you know, having having experience. You know, there was a lot that I knew. the The program and studying for the ARES also showed me. Oh my God, there's a ton I also don't know. And it was my hope, along with the school's hope. You know, their goal. Anyone that enrolls in the IPAL. They want you to commit to the idea of of trying to complete all of your all of your exams while you're in school. You know, it's it's a big feather in their hat to have someone cross that graduation line and also be ready for the license. I was able to get halfway. You know, I got three of the exams done while in school. Yeah, then after May, I was able to knock out the remaining three. Um, December 9th was my final exam. And I nailed them all. Maybe by the skin of my teeth on some of them, but I nailed them all. Once I moved out of the Twin Cities, I thought my opportunity was gone. You know, I thought it was a goal unreachable. So well, to be why able, was that? Why did you think that that was unreachable at that point? Trying to go back to a master's program while living in Brainerd, I, there's no way to do it that I knew of. You know, the the Boston program. I'm not sure how long they've been accredited for that. That was the impression that I was under. I thought it was a goal that, um, you know, unlike, unlike Wisconsin, Wisconsin's a state that still accounts for experience. You know, you can become licensed if you show you've got all the experience uh, to slide in. Minnesota doesn't have that. So that's, yeah, that's why I thought it was, it was that goal that was beyond my reach. And, and now here I am, I've got the, I've got the and carb and the AIA behind my name and it feels pretty damn cool. How long did it take you um with uh like when you include school and everything? If we only want to go back as far as the master's program, you know, because I suppose that's that was the only accredited program that I that I went through. Right. Uh beginning in 
in uh, spring of 2019. So spring of 2019 till May of 22. And you passed every exam on the first try. First try. Good Lord. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what I guess, so you use Black Spectacles to uh, to help you prepare. What other tools did you use? What other resources did you use? Uh, a friend had gone through the ARE uh, 5.0 not too far ahead of me. Um, so So I was able to use his books. And I did that somewhat. The books I found to be problematic just because with the experience that I had, it really wasn't a good gauge on on what I needed to know. Because some of those books, they drill down into such nitpick stuff that I found myself getting lost in the weeds a lot of times. With the last three exams, I was to a point where I really used Black Spectacles all on its own. I really didn't look elsewhere. Um, I did a little bit, you know, NCARB has, has uh, like one practice exam per, uh, per exam. And, and yeah, you know, that's, that's another good gauge for, uh, for those practice sessions. But really, really what it came down to for me was using those practice exams. I would always do two runs just to get a good idea of kind of where my holes were with kind of the remarks and uh, reference, reference ideas, you know, with, with the questions that you don't pass, uh, you know, I would dig into the professional handbook or, or some of these other things, you know, to read up on that. But it really was the practice exams that, that got me where I needed to go. And I found them to be honestly, the most useful tool, you know, everything else, like I said, it was either a little bit too vague or it went way too in the weeds. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that being able to pass all six on the first try, you know, it it worked well. I want to know, what did you do to celebrate each exam as you went through it? <laughs> and maybe, I don't know, maybe you, you got the provisional pass and then you celebrated and you did something or maybe you waited. Like, walk me through, what was your, how did you celebrate? The The moment that I will never forget, and this was the case with each exam, you get to that, you get to that final screen, you know, where you can either see your provisional or you can just exit and your hand always just, it, it's just shaking like crazy. You can barely control the mouse. And I would hit that button to see the pro, uh, provisional results. And I would read, I, I would sit here for probably four or five minutes reading and rereading so i'm like i can't be seeing this right you know does it say i i likely have passed i have not passed and then finally i would close out of that screen and i would i would just sit back and stare at the ceiling for probably 10 minutes just completely overwhelmed that wow i i think i just I think I just nailed it. But yeah, I mean, I'm married. I've got three kids. My wife is in architecture. Her mom is in architecture. You know, so it was always that coolest moment being able to let them know, you know, one out of six down or, you know, of course, that that most amazing one, six out of six. Yeah, yeah. Our kids range from age six to age 13. And and uh, yeah, we'd always do the celebratory meal and and that's kind of what it was. I don't know. Did you do something special to celebrate actually passing, you know, crossing the threshold and, and becoming a licensed architect? As a family, we kind of had we kind of had tentative plans uh, where we wanted to do we wanted to do a family Disney vacation. And, you know, Disney being in their their uh, what is it? 150th anniversary or 100 100. I don't remember. Yeah. We thought that would be a pretty cool thing. Then a really amazing opportunity came up for our 13-year-old where uh, there's an educational tour program that uh, our local com uh, local community gets engaged with. So, so she's going to Greece in wow. June. What does it mean to you to be licensed? You know, I mean, it's a hell of a journey. There's a hell of a lot of work, a lot of money. Now you're licensed. You know, what does it mean? It is, it is nothing short of the ultimate accomplishment. It is that simple. It really did kind of kill me when back in 2018, when I started seeing that ceiling closing in, kind of faced with the thought of, of this is it. And, and now being able to push through that and get to this level, I, I, I can't say it any more than it is the ultimate accomplishment and it's the coolest thing to be able to to be able to share with my kids you really can't do anything it's beyond amazing yeah like some of the conversations that i've that i've had with them on one hand it would have been great 
if you know to follow just the traditional path of you go through your bachelor's you get your master's you get licensed but there also really is a a rewarding aspect uh you know having a number of years of experience and then taking a master's program being able to go back into that world of high design you come at it with with both the level of knowledge but also just a sense of 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 appreciation that it is probably impossible to have you know if if I'd have done this like when I was 25 or whatever that age would be. And then of course, like Boston's program, it's it's one of those where this information and this access to knowledge and 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 the new experiences and and bring it right back to what you're doing. Yeah, it'd be it'd be great to have done this 20 years ago, but I, I can't say I regret it. Is there like a specific example of a door that is now open for you that was previously closed? So the company that I was at right before going to school, I actually I actually made the decision to to quit that job, um, not because I was unhappy or anything like that, but it really was. <laughs> It was that recognition that I could request to go to part time while I'm going to school, but you know when you're at a firm for a while and when they know when they know your capabilities, when they know this or that, that part time you know it becomes that slippery slope of next thing you know you know you've got a project and you and you're still pushing way further on your work hours than what you want to be doing. So I quit. There was another company in town. I'm I. I good friends with uh, the vice president of architecture there. And like a couple of years before that, he had approached me, you know, because they were slammed with work. They needed help. At the time, I wasn't ready to switch. You know, I was happy where I was at. But then when this happened, I I got a hold of him again. Hey, Mike, you still looking for, you know, you still looking for help? You know, we kind of carved out the arrangement, but it made it clear from the beginning with this path that I'm on, you know, the uh, the path to, you know, ownership is it's it's on my mark you know is is that something that is part of my path here you know with your company and and so it's it's been that ongoing conversation each year and uh you know now that i've now that i've gotten licensed yeah we're moving forward towards that yeah so you know part of it had to do with just being just being clear about my expectations and uh you know asking I suppose, asking the right questions to make sure that we're all on the same page. And we are. Were there people who helped you along the way? Like when you think back to your sort of journey, uh, maybe there were certain people that helped. And if there were, who were those people? And I guess what what was it they helped you with? So way, way back at, at uh, one of my first jobs, when I made the decision to go back to school for my bachelor's degree, one of the architects that I worked pretty closely with, her words to me was, remember to play. And it seemed like the most bizarre thing to hear, you know, from the architect you've been working with as you're about to, you know, go back to design school. Remember to play. But it has stuck with me. It has impacted me to no end. And then while I was in design school, one of one of the professors, I don't even remember what class it was, but there was a moment as she's talking and, and her words were, stay fascinated. So those two things have really kind of driven, you know, they they created and drove a new outlook on, on just the way I try to almost view everything. And then you wind up having kids. And those those two phrases take on a very meaningful, you know, notion. It is, it's it's without question how I try to approach pretty much everything I encounter in life, whether it's work related. Stay fascinated, remember to play be grateful you know all all those different things and it and it is kind of interesting in you know the work that we do now again it's it's a smaller community so you you might wind up you might wind up working on a boring warehouse you know where you where you you certainly could approach it from from the attitude of of you know it's just industrial boring nobody really cares but even in those opportunities you know having 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 that playful mindset that fascinated mindset to bring to them something that that uh, uh they don't expect you know it's it's a meaning it's a meaningful thing that uh like i said it's 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 stuck with me for a long time and the masters program oh my god <laughs> i'm not sure if i would wish that 
process upon most people. It is definitely a hell of a thing. The resources and flexibility that my current company provided me with, you know, it, if I needed extra time off, if I needed it, you name it, you know, they, they afforded it to me. It was, I couldn't have done it without them. Of course, there's, there's the family aspect where I, what, I remember coming, coming up on, on graduation and, and you're excited because, you know, school life is about to end. You can, you can rejoin the human race. Um, you can come back to your family, all these different things you can. And the idea was, you know, the thought in my head, pick up where I left off. <laughs> Even almost a year later, it's not picking up where I left off. It is, it's kind of finding out how deep that hole was. You kind of dug yourself into you know, because you kind of become so isolated, you have to push so many things off. Uh, yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm finally getting close to the the uh, <laughs> close to digging myself out of that hole. When you go back to you know the actual cadence and of taking those tests and and so on and so forth, you know, one of the things that folks might benefit from understanding is you know what your study approach was. I mean. Most people fail at least one exam. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, the experience that you had, but then also like, what was your approach to studying? The first few exams, I really did. I really did rely on, on kind of the books first. You know, I, I, I would read through those. I would take those practice quizzes that are part of the, part of the books. I would go through the uh, Black Spectacles videos, and then I would save the exams for last. And that approach worked. I mean, you know, I, I passed, but towards the end, you know, that takes up a lot of time, you know, it takes up a lot of time doing that. And, and with everything you're, you're always trying to figure out, um, you know, how can I reduce this, this time and still, still pass by the end when I was relying primarily on the practice exams, the things running through my head, the first thing was take these exams and find out where your holes are. Uh, the other thing that I would always find, there is such a particular mindset that you need to be in to take these tests. The things that I uncovered, you've got to look for the key words. You've got to look for the red herrings. You don't just look at the question, you look at the you look at the answer choices. The programming and evaluation test. That test, that test wasn't particularly hard for me, but because that test you're bouncing back and forth between so much information. What I found was about two thirds of the way through the test, I'm like, holy crap, I am running out of time. And by the time I got to probably the last 12 questions, you know, so I'm in the case studies at this point, I didn't even have, I didn't even have time. When I clicked out of that exam, I think I had 37 seconds left. Those last few questions, I wasn't even reading the question I was looking directly at the answers and and you do learn after taking a few of these tests that to some degree you can weed out you know you're not even looking for the right answer you're looking for the wrong ones and if you've got four choices and if you can weed out three of them there you go. It was some of those kind of test taking efficiencies that I really honed in on. So again, you know, it was it was kind of training yourself to look look for the right information. Um, one of the practices that I always got into, I I would use the highlighter function or the strike through function to make sure that I'm not glossing over, you know, maybe the last part of that sentence where that's what you really want to be looking for. Everything else is kind of throwing you off, sending you down a myriad of possibilities. Um, you know, so identifying how to read the question properly, I think is a, it's a huge part of it. Yeah, learning how, learning how to figure out what are they really asking and don't get lost in all of the things that turn into the what ifs. Oh man, well it 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 depends. <laughs> no, don't let yourself go into the it depends category cuz yeah, you know, you've only got 90 seconds or 2 minutes, you know, to finish any one of these. And yeah, that that one exam where I almost ran out of time, that was that was a big eye opener. You know, okay. 
time to approach things differently. That's super helpful because <clears throat> you're right. I mean, the way those questions are written, they're designed to like throw in, like at the end, like you said, that one qualifier that if you, if you ignore it, you know, that's the thing that'll. Yeah. Yeah. Cause good. all of those answer choices, they play off of that. Exactly. You know? Nine times out of 10, you can, you can find your way to making that one make sense. Except that's not what they're asking. What's your number one takeaway from your experience? I think even if I were just to limit it to the test taking aspect, I think the best way to kind of say it, there's so many different things that you can do in the profession of architecture. What I found until you become licensed or until you're kind of going down that path, you know, so much of that I never touched. It was, it was the project architect. Um, you know, I knew these things existed, but there was a I was never in on any programming sessions. I was never in on any, uh, you know, maybe specifications things or, or things of that nature. So all of these different things, you very quickly, uh, you not only gain access to the right information, you know, you kind of learn how to look through the professional handbook and realize that even though this thing is a daunting 1,500 or 1,800 pages, you know how to use it. It quickly makes you competent enough to uh well become a valuable more valuable member of the team again in small firms like ours where you you do have to play all of those roles um for me yeah it was it was a huge launch pad 